Okay, good evening everybody. My name is Conor Romani. Uh, I lecture here in the Faculty in Constitutional Law and Child Law and I work particularly at the intersection between the Constitution and issues relating to children. Uh, and I'm here this evening to speak to you about the Constitutional Amendment on Children. I'm conscious that there's quite a few people in the room who've heard me speak about this before and perhaps once was enough, so I'm not going to uh, do my usual thing on this. I'm going to do something a little bit different tonight uh, and there's a reason why I asked to go last. Uh, the idea that I have is it comes from my experience of speaking about this issue uh, around the country at different events here in UCC and in other law schools and in media events and so on. Uh, and in response to a common reaction that I received when I speak about this issue, uh, where people often say to me, well, what's this really going to achieve? This isn't going to fix anything on its own. We need to also do all these other things as well. Uh, now, I'm not sure that I've ever argued, and I'm not sure that anybody else who advocates constitutional reform on children has ever really argued that a constitutional amendment on children is a panacea that's going to solve all problems that exist relating to children and the law. That's certainly not the argument I've ever put across. And, and, but the, you sometimes encounter suspicion of the amendment and maybe even a certain amount of resistance to the amendment on the basis that it's not going to fix everything, so why should we do it at all? And in response, I would say, well, no, it's not going to fix everything on its own. But the fact that it's not a panacea doesn't mean it's not important. Uh, a constitutional amendment on children, I believe, has a very significant role to play in improving the law relating to children. It is only one part of a very complex picture, as we've been hearing over the course of this evening's event, but I still think it is a necessary and indeed essential part of that picture. And so what I want to do really is uh, to try to run through what the amendment is aimed at achieving and to tie it into what the other speakers have been presenting to you and hopefully present a convincing argument that if you agree with the other speakers and if you support the kinds of reforms that they are calling for, well then you should also support a constitutional amendment on children because it ties in with those aims and will help to further those aims uh, and assure, ensure a more holistic and more effective reform of the legal system relating to children. So just first of all to give a, a very brief background on the reform process because this is not a new issue. This isn't something that only arose politically in the last year or two. The first major call for a constitutional amendment on children in this country came from Justice Catherine McGuinness in the Kilkenny Incest Investigation Report in 1993. Now that's 19 years ago and a whole generation of children have been born and have grown up and have ceased to be children in the eyes of the law and we have still not done anything about this. Uh, the Constitution Review Group made this call in 1996, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in 1998, the Fianna Fáil-led government under Bertie Ahern published legislation in 2007 and an all-party Iraq this committee under Mary O'Rourke secured all-party agreement and a wording for an amendment in 2010. So this is something which the political system in Ireland and Irish society has long agreed is necessary and that we should do. It's not new, but why have we not done it yet? It keeps getting kicked down the road. The wording which was agreed on in 2010 uh, was committed to once again this time last year in the programme for government, uh, which is committed to by the, um, the Labour Party and Fine Gael in their current coalition. The Minister for Children has stated her intention to press ahead with that process this year, but we still do not have a wording, we still do not have a date for the amendment. Um, so, just to, to speak a little bit about the Iraq this committee wording from the uh, 2010 committee and what that was aimed at achieving. Uh, it had a number of elements to it, and I just want to, to run through them and just connect them back to some of the points made by the other speakers. Uh, first of all, it proposes to grant constitutional recognition to the rights of all children as individuals, regardless of the marital status of their parents. Now, if we go back to the first two presentations which we received from, from Fergus and Claire, they obviously spoke about a lot about the position of children whose parents are not married and are thus uh, precluded from accessing certain elements of the law. Now, a constitutional amendment, uh, as currently conceived, is not proposing to redefine the constitutional family. It's not proposing to amend Article 41. Now, this is partly a political issue. In an ideal world, uh, I think, given the reality that one out of every three children born in Ireland uh, for, for a significant period of time now is born outside of marriage, that would be part and parcel of this reform as well. Uh, but the political will doesn't appear to be there to grasp that metal right now. And I suppose you have to be realistic about the politics of it. Uh, and perhaps uh, that issue, if that's not going to be attainable right now, well then why let that act as a, a block to the other things which you can achieve? So the question of 
certain parents being excluded from constitutional protection is not part of the amendment. However, uh, those parents can still be dealt with on a legislative level outside of the scope of a constitutional amendment in various ways. But what the amendment does propose to do is to clarify some lingering doubts from the case law as to whether or not children whose parents are not married actually do have the full remit of constitutional rights that other children have. Uh, we have some case law which says that they do. Equally, we have some case law that casts some doubts on that. And so in the context of parents who are not married, be they same-sex or opposite-sex couples, uh, the constitutional amendment proposes to clear up that particular area of doubt and make it uh, crystal clear that all children have the same same constitutional rights regardless of the marital status of their parents. Uh, so in that sense it ties into the, some of the, the calls for reform made by our first two commentators this evening. Now a second issue which the amendment proposes to deal with is one which pretty much everybody touched on which is the question of the best interests of the child. All of you are familiar with the best interest principle. It's a principle which we have in our legislation dealing with guardianship, dealing with adoption, dealing with childcare. Uh, but there's been a number of very high profile case, Supreme Court cases over the years, including the Regia H case in 1986, the uh, PKU case in 2001, and the Baby Anne case in 2006, which have shown how the current constitutional provisions create difficulties for the full and effective implementation of the best interest principle in Irish law. And the constitutional amendment proposes to uh, address that question by constitutionalizing the best interest principle and if you read the Iraq this committee report uh, it makes it very clear that uh, part of what it is intending to do is to overcome the, the difficulties which are, are, have been thrown up by some of those Supreme Court cases. I'm not going to go into detail on that right now, but there's plenty of literature out there, or indeed uh, there, there's a, a video online of a more detailed talk I've given which I'd be happy to send to anybody if you send me an email. Uh, moving on then to uh, some of the points which have been raised, and in particular by Colm and Noel, about the idea of trying to keep children out of the court system and avoid a situation where uh, a, a very adversarial and uh, undesirable approach is taken in terms of uh, taking children into court far after the harm has been done and taking them into a system that is less than ideal in many ways. Part of what the amendment looks to achieve is to move away from our current focus in Article 42.5 on this very narrow category of exceptional cases uh, where parents fail in their duties towards their children and where the state should then supply the place of the parents. And Article 42.5, as currently phrased, uh, is set up in a very all-or-nothing manner which uh, envisages uh, waiting until there's a very serious level of failure and then stepping in and taking the children out of that environment altogether. Now that, of course, is just a constitutional principle. The Child Care Act clearly, uh, even as currently formulated, does uh, allow for some more flexibility than that. But part of what the amendment is designed to achieve is to move away from that all or nothing uh, approach in Article 42.5, uh, to shift away from the exceptional cases, cases test towards a proportionality test, and to, to move away from the reference to supplying the place of the parents to include the idea of also supplementing the place of the parents and engaging in family support at an earlier stage before the harm is, gets to such a severe level. Um, and so in terms of, of that idea of family support that Colin mentioned, that idea that Noel mentioned of trying to keep certain cases from ever getting to, to, to court in the same way. Uh, part of what the amendment is looking to achieve is to place a greater emphasis on less intervention at an earlier stage designed to avoid such serious harm occurring, designed to avoid cases getting to court uh, at such a serious stage, uh, and in that sense further those, those same goals. Now another point which the amendment covers is granting children a right to such protection and care as is necessary for their welfare. Uh, now, we heard from a number of the speakers, including, uh, including Colm and Denise in particular, about the need for a properly resourced system. Now this provision is something which has the potential to aid that goal. If children have a constitutional right to such care and prote to such protection and care as is necessary to secure their welfare, and adequate resources are not provided in order to make that possible within the care system or within the family support system, well then this is potentially something which could be litigated. Now the analogy I would draw here would be to the way in which Article 42.4 of the Constitution, which provides for the issue of free primary education, has been used to secure greatly enhanced resource provision in the area of ch uh, education for children with special educational needs. Now of course there are still problems in that area, but nonetheless I think the evidence is very clear that the constitutional litigation 
legislation which took place in that area, starting with the Paul O'Donoghue case in 1993 and moving through over about a 10 to 15 year period thereafter, uh, secured greatly enhanced resource provision for children with special educational needs. It didn't fix every problem, but it certainly made things much better than they were before that constitutional litigation took place. Um, and so including that right in the constitution, I think, is potentially very valuable. I'll come back briefly to the cost issue in just a second. But finally then, the amendment uh, also proposes to constitutionalise the child's right to be heard in proceedings affecting the child. Clearly, Eamon's presentation was all about that. And if you have a current situation where uh, including the child's voice in proceedings is a statutory discretion, one which we heard is only exercising 40% of public law cases, for example, and if you move that to being a constitutional right of the child, well then clearly uh, that's something which is going to happen on a much more regular and much more effective basis. Yes, more detail needs to be teased out about how exactly you make that work, but by constitutionalising that right, you change the emphasis and you change the mindset in a big way. So this is something which... As I said, we've been talking about for a long time, which lots of people have agreed on. This wording was agreed on by all parties, broadly welcomed by government organisations like the Ombudsman for Children and the Irish Human Rights Commission, by non-NGOs such as Barnardo's, uh, by academic commentators. But yet it still hasn't happened. What are the fears? Well, one of the potential fears, which I, I mean, there are no, a, a number of things which are maybe derailing this. I don't have time to deal with them all. But to mention briefly the cost issue, just to, to respond to the idea, is this going to cost money that we don't have right now? Well, first of all, I would, I would challenge anybody to really stand up, certainly in a room like we're in this evening, and say that we don't want to spend money or we're unwilling to spend money on the most vulnerable children in society in the care system that we just don't think we can actually afford to provide the necessary resources to uh, solve the, the problems which they're facing. Um, but more to the point, this is something which could be cost effective in the long run. More early intervention means less children in care. Uh, more, uh, it also means potentially less people interacting with uh, the health system or the criminal justice system at a later point. But those payoffs only occur in the long run. They don't occur in a five-year electoral cycle, which is why politicians potentially are unwilling to commit the resources in the short term. If you make it a constitutional obligation, as I mentioned in the analogy to special educational needs, then this is no longer a, a discretionary matter in quite the same way for politicians. It's a constitutional obligation which they have, and they're far more likely to do that uh, and to take a longer-term perspective where you have the force of that constitutional provision and the possibility of litigation uh, around that provision to make that happen. Um, so in that sense, my dear Minister, um, to finish off the evening, would be if this is something which will assist all of the other reforms which we mentioned, if it's something which so many people have agreed on for so long, well then, what are we waiting for? We have a wording which has broad support. So my first dear Minister would be, can we please uh, go with that wording and stop talking about what the wording should be? And the second would be, can we have an actual date for a referendum before this slides off the agenda once again? Thank you very much.